with the very truth. You are who Jesus says you are. You are a son and a daughter of the living King. And if you know Jesus this morning, then guess what? You are free. Yes. You're free. Yes. You're free to worship. You're free to be. You're free to dance. There's a song in there somewhere, but I can't think what it is. But it is so true. If you are a child of God, then you are free this morning. And so thank you for singing that, encouraging us all. I usually just go cut it, but we've got to listen to that. But... Um, yeah, I just want to welcome visitors as well. Obviously, there are quite a few visitors amongst us this morning. Um, we are thrilled to see you. Thank you for coming and joining us. And uh, I just really pray that God will speak to you this morning and to all of us this morning, that God will really speak to us through his word this morning. And so for those who are obviously the first time here, I'm going to speak for the next 20, 25 minutes, hopefully. Um, uh, and I'm going to open the Bible and we're going to look at a, a piece of scripture together. But I thought it'd be good to just have a real quick recap for everybody that doesn't know what we've been doing for the last, this is, well, this is week 23 now. So we have been going through the book of Acts. And for those who don't know um, where the book of Acts is in the Bible, that is in the New Testament. It follows the first four books in the Bible, which are the Gospels, all about Jesus. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read all about Jesus, who he is what he did on the earth, how he went around doing good. And then at the end of each of those books, we hear how he was crucified on a cross for each and every one of us. But then wonderfully, how he was raised from the dead, how he was raised from the dead. God raised him from the dead. He was put in a tomb, dead, dead. The stone was rolled in front of it. And God raised him on the third day, just as the scriptures said they would do. So then, after that book, then we go into the book of Acts. And in Acts 1, we read at the start where Jesus is with his disciples for 40 days, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And then from there, uh, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, um, we start to look at the early church. So how the church formed, how it functions how it grew, how it went from town to town, to city to city, to nation to nation. And you will notice there is a baptism pool. So my next point was that straight after a baptism, that's when we then see the gospel going out to the rest of the world. We actually see it go into a whole new continent straight after a baptism. That's the power of a baptism as well. It's, it's free and it's getting out. The word gets out there. And so um, last week I spoke on Acts chapter 14 and just looking at what makes a church a church. How do we go from a small group, a small gathering of people and what are the practices and what are the roles and functions that need to be put in place that take it from a gathering of people into a church. So that's where we left it last week. And then so this week um, we're going to read from Acts chapter 15. Um, and I'm going to read from the New International Version this morning. And because I don't know everybody in the room, um, the words are going to come up on the screen behind me just in case you don't have a Bible. So Acts 15, and we'll start at verse 1. It says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Was that right? Was it word for word? Yeah. Phew, I got the right translation. You never know sometimes, do you? Sometimes you just click on the wrong button. Um, but the dispute here was about how people received their salvation. And the question is ultimately, is it by grace or is it by works? That was the ultimate question. Is it by the grace of God or is it by works of man? And so grace means the unmerited favor of God, the undeserved, the unjustified favor of God. And these men that have traveled down from Jerusalem are saying, you must follow the Jewish law to receive your salvation. 
Salvation simply means our deliverance from sin and all of its consequences, not some of them. You are delivered from sin and every knock-on effect that sin has on your life. That is what salvation means. And so I'm going to give you the answer right at the start before we go through this. We receive our salvation by grace. By grace, the unmerited favor of God. We do not have to work for our salvation. You cannot work for your salvation. It's God's gift that is given to each and every one of us. You know, we do not have to follow the Jewish law or any law to be made right with God. There is no law on this earth that can make you right with God. The only way that you can be made right with God is through Jesus and through Jesus alone. And everything we've sung about there this morning, that is God's gift to you and to me, is the gift of Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross so that we can be made right with God. And so as I read that first bit, I tried to emphasize the words apostles and elders. And I'm going to say those two words five times throughout this scripture this morning. But if these men, well, no, not if, these men had come from Jerusalem and clearly the leaders there had been tolerating the message of works and not confronting this obvious division. If they come from Jerusalem, they must have been talking about it there to then bring it down to Antioch where they were. And so that meant that the, the elders that were there, the believers that were there, they were not confronting the believers to say, no, that's not right. But I'm going to tell you what is right this morning. Well, actually, the Bible is going to tell us what's right. I'm not going to tell you. The Bible is going to tell us what's right this morning. But it's so important that divisions are nipped in the bud straight away. There can be no division in the church. And so for us, the reason why I was emphasizing elders and uh, apostles is that leaders in the local church, we must be clear on matters of truth. This is a fundamental truth as to how we receive our salvation. And as elders and leaders in the church, we must be clear on what these truths are. Because if I'm not clear, then guess what? There's a good chance I will say something which will cause a question to be raised in your minds, which is what we're going to read in a minute, and that cannot happen. We must be clear on matters of truth. And again, just to back that up, if we look in uh, Titus um, chapter 1, verse 9, and we're looking at the qualification of elders, it says that he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, that, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. In other words, to be able to correct any errors that come as elders, we must be able to do that. And so why is that important? Because the elders are the, local, are the government in the local church. We oversee what happens here in this building. But it's the role of the apostles to set the doctrine. And the doctrine, that is what we believe, why we believe it, and how we practice what we believe. But then it's the elders that implement and continue to make sure that that doctrine is held firmly here. And when you read in Acts 2, the, the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is the foundation of what we do and what we believe. And the apostles that we're reading about here are the ones that set this for us today. What we read about in and throughout the book of, of Acts, what the apostles set as a foundation is what we believe as a foundation here. And New Spring is built on the teaching of apostles and prophets. And although there has been some change in leadership over the years, we have not moved from any part of our foundation whatsoever. The apostles' doctrine that was laid in this church is the apostles' teaching that we believe today. We have not deviated. We have not changed. Why? Because it's a solid foundation. It's a good foundation for which we are building on today. That is why. It's the word of God. We know it to be truth, and we're building on it today. And so it's vital that elders are able to teach the word of God and to bring correction where it's needed. 
So that was the first part of the dispute. So if we just move on to the next um, section, please, Dan. So verse 3, and it says, The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through um, Phoenicia, thank you, John. I've even got it written down here because it confused me. Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, You know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it through the grace of our Lord Jesus. We are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened and chose a people from his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. I just feel that it's really important to say here that it's, it was the apostles and the elders who made the judgment. And I've said it's based on their judgment that we build our faith today. And there are three key elements on which they based their judgment. The first one was the revelation of Peter and Paul. A few weeks ago, we looked at the vision that um, Peter had in Acts 10 at Cornelius' house, where the Lord showed Peter that it is he, Jesus, who makes us clean. And that there is no distinction, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. If Jesus says that we are clean, guess what? You're clean. It's that simple. Jesus says it, we believe it, that settles it. It is that simple. It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus makes us clean by believing in him. That's how we get clean. It's all through the power of Jesus. The wonderful name of Jesus. So the first thing, it was based on revelation. The second thing was that their judgment was made on what the word of God says. The word of God. I should have my Bible with me really. This book is our plumb line. Everything we believe is taken from here and here alone. Nowhere else. If it's not in here, we don't do it. If it is in here, we do it. Again, so simple. Thank God for his word, for his truth. He makes it. It's in black and white. There's no room for argument. There's no gray in this. It's black and white. The Bible says it. We believe it. That settles it. And so the judgment was made on what the word of God said. Now, obviously, they didn't have a Bible like this when they were talking about this. They had scrolls. Um, They didn't have a lovely bound version like we have today. 
But um, James stands up after um, Peter and Paul have, have said about what, all the wonderful things that God has been doing through them. And he reminds them that this is what the prophets foretold about Jesus. That Jesus would come and rebuild David's tent. That he would restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek Jesus. You know, and this is really significant because we read in the Bible of two tents. There's the tabernacle and there was David's tent. And the tabernacle had a huge curtain in it which separated mankind from God. There was one person who could stand, well, he couldn't even stand before God, who could go into God's presence. And that was the priest. And there was a huge curtain in this massive tent that stopped us from getting Stop mankind from getting into God's presence. But David's tent was open for everyone to go and worship. And when Jesus was on the cross, and when he said it was finished, the curtain was torn in two. And now everybody, everybody has access to God through Jesus. And so when, when uh, the prophet there is foretelling of um, David's tent being rebuilt being restored. That's exactly what he's talking about, that mankind would be able to enter into the very presence of God through Jesus. And with that, if there's no curtain, then there's no division. There's no border. There's no boundary. It's open for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. Jesus loves you. And when he said it was finished and the curtain was torn in two, he meant it. He's not coming back again to die again because maybe he made a mistake. No, he's died once and for all. He's raised again. He's seated with his father in heavenly places. And one day he's coming back. And he's coming back for his church. He's coming back for his people. And if you know Jesus, then he's coming back for you. He's coming back for me. Why? Because it's through Jesus we have access to God. Thank you, Jesus. And so, in terms of this dispute, the word of God is just really showing that there is no division between Jew and Gentile. There's no barriers. There's no one sect. There's no obstacles. And the obstacle here is the Jewish law. Um, But through Jesus, we now have direct access to God. And we know it's through the work of Jesus on the cross for each and every one of us. And then the third the third thing is they're looking as we read through this scripture is that there was an amen from the apostles, the elders, and in verse 28, which we'll read in a minute, and from the Holy Spirit. In other words, there was agreement amongst everyone. Yes, this is what we need to do with this situation. This is what has been revealed to us through Peter. This is what the word of God says, and there's an agreement and there's an amen with the Holy Spirit. So the judgment was made on that. And so if we just move on to uh, verse 22, please, which then says, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called uh, Basabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. This is what I was saying about the the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit And to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. I love that. (laughs) Farewell. End of letter. Abrupt ending. We're stopping there. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people, read, people who read it, sorry, the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. 
Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After, sending, after spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So we see from that one judgment that was made on that day and sent to the churches that it showed that there was a unity of truth and doctrine amongst the churches. There was no division, no division. And it was received as an encouragement, but also as an instruction from the Lord. And it's important that we must guard and we must hold on to the truths of our faith and our practice. In 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21, it says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have departed from the faith. A little, probably a bit of an, an obvious truth here, but we're not free to believe whatever we like. There are key non-negotiables. There are key fundamental truths that we profess that we cannot deviate from. And I just want to say that that is why for the past 23 weeks, by one Sunday, that is why it's been the elders in the church that have been teaching. Why? Because we want to make sure that a sound doctrine is preached in in the church. Now, that doesn't mean that others won't be teaching. I know in the coming weeks, Elizabeth is teaching. I know Kate is, is talking, is, is going to preach as well. But what I mean is, it's really important that we are clear. This is what we believe in this church. And so that is why um, it has been the elders so far that have done all the teaching over the last 23 weeks. But the key non-negotiable that we are looking at this morning and what this dispute was about, and it's so fundamental to our faith, is that we are saved by grace. And remember, grace means the unmerited favor of God. I'm showing my age a little bit here, but actually, do you know what? I'm probably not. I'm probably all right. When I was at school... We used to get merits. Then it went from merits to team points. And now it's praising stars. That's what my boys get. See, Adam knows praising stars. And you get little postcards and all that kind of lovely stuff that you get at Outward Grange and Quegs and wherever else you go. But we used to get merits when I was in um, junior school. And to get a merit, I had to work hard. I never got a merit for just being me. That was never enough. I had to do more to get a merit. But the unmerited favor of God, you have to do nothing for it. It's a free gift to each and every one of us. We are not saved by works. We cannot be saved by works. There's nothing that I can do that I physically can do myself to make me right with God. Nothing I can do. Apart from, put my faith in Jesus. That is what makes me right with God. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. And Abraham was the first person to be circumcised. But in Romans 4... 9 to 16, and I should have put this up. I apologize, I forgot to put this one up. It says this, is this, blessedness not, is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited, credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, 
He is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised but also who followed in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Verse 16. Therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace we may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Abraham was justified, he, excuse me, he was made right before he was circumcised. And as we've just read, it was by faith that he received all of God's promises. And you know, we all have faith. You might not know it. You might think, no, I don't. Well, I'm going to correct you. You do. And here's a really silly example. As people were walking in this morning, I wasn't watching all of you, but I was looking around just to make sure that nobody did this. But you are all sat on these wonderful green chairs. Okay? They're comfy. They're not the best chairs in the world but they do what they need to do, okay? You are sat on them believing that they are going to hold your weight. Nobody came in here this morning with a spanner or a screwdriver and looked underneath them to make sure there were no screws loose. No, you just sat down on them because you had the faith that, oh, it'll take my weight. I've got faith right now that I can jump on this floor and not go through it. Might lose my microphone though. Really silly examples, but we exercise faith all. Oh no, I have broke it. There we go. Um, but we exercise faith all the time. But Romans 12:3 says, "For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Everyone has faith." But we're to have faith in Jesus. And that faith will see you saved. Will see you justified. Will see you made right with God and your future assured. That's what our faith in Jesus brings us. The Bible tells us that before the foundations of the earth that he chose us. That means he chose you and he chose me. And he chose you and he chose you. And he chose you, and he chose you. He chose, he chose us before the foundations of the earth. He chose us. And you might be thinking, but you don't know what I've done in my life. You've got no idea how many times I've blown it. How could God possibly, possibly love me? And I said this last week, and I'll say it again. Well, this I do know. If God can love me, he can love you. And I'm going to give you another illustration. There's a guy on YouTube, and um, he's got loads of videos on YouTube. But there's one particular one where um, he goes around and he's interviewing American scientists who are atheists and believe in evolution. And he goes around and asks loads of questions, and he debunks the whole thing. But there's another video, and I love this one. And so I'm speaking about myself. This is not a judgment, just in case anyone takes this wrong. Please don't take this wrong. You'll understand why I say that in a second. But he's, he's talking to these two students in a park. And um, he's really open with them. And they're having this really nice chat. But he just drops in every now and then just a really subtle question. So they'll be talking and just say, have you ever told a lie? Just a little white lie. And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. And the conversation continues. And then... A couple of minutes later, he might drop in another question. Um, Have you ever stolen anything? You know, maybe just a pen from work or something like that. Like, yeah, 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 I suppose we have. Yeah, yeah. And he turns to the lad and goes, Have you ever never have you ever looked at a woman and gone, Fwa? And he's like, and he looks at his girlfriend and goes, "Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I have. And it, but then he turns to him and says, but would you say that you are a good person? 
And they both go, yeah, yes, I would say I'm a, I'm a good person. And he gets them with this point. He says, well, you've just told me that you are a liar, that you're a stealer, and you're a lustful person. And they just stop dead in their tracks. As if to say, ah, you've got me there, haven't you? <laughs> he might only be small, subtle things. But the reason why I bring that up, okay, and I said that if God can love me, he can love anyone in this room and anyone in this world. Have I ever told a lie? Yes. Have I ever stolen something? Yes, I have. It's not like I've robbed a bank or anything like that. But I have nicked a pen from work. I'll admit that. I'm ashamed of it, but I've done it. I can't hide from it. No point in lying about it. Have I ever looked at another woman and gone, Fwar. well, thankfully, my wife is not in this room. And so... <laughs> She's downstairs looking after my children. <laughs> but yes, I have. I have. So what does that make me? A liar, a thief, and a lustful man. But, and here's the good bit, here's the but. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It also goes on to say that all have fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus knew this about me. He knew what I'd do, but he still died for me. He knew what I would do, and he still endured the cross for me. He knew that I would blow it, and he still took all that pain for me. Why? Because he loves me. And even whilst I was still sinning, he loved me still. And I can never get away from that. Because he's a God of love. And he loves each and every one of us that is in this room. I haven't earned my salvation. I can't earn my salvation. It's a gift from God. And it's a gift that's here this morning. And so... Um, my last illustration. Um, people who know me and Kate really well um, know what we're like. I've been careful how to say this. Um, people often look at us and think they've got their lives sorted. They've got all their ducks in a row. Guess what? We haven't. We haven't. We have not always got our ducks in a row and a really silly illustration but a powerful illustration Alex rings me today and says John in one hour I'm coming around to your house and we're going to have a coffee or we're going to have a beer whichever I don't mind I say yes mate no worries come around give me an hour I'll be ready for you. What am I going to do the moment I hang up that call? I'm going to run downstairs. I'm going to vacuum everything. The polish is coming out. I'm going to make sure that all the boys' shoes are put away in the, the cupboard. Uh, I'm going to make sure the dog is out of the way. In other words, I am going to try and make my house perfect. But do you know what? It's impossible. It's impossible to make my house perfect. Even if I did everything There'd still be something. There would still be something that would hold my house back from being perfect. But if I'm sat at home this afternoon and Alex knocks on my door, uninvited, <laughs> I have a choice. I can either open the door and go, hey, up, mate, it's like, I've come for a coffee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever. Do you know what? You can... You can come into my house, you can see us, warts and all. This is us. Or, I can politely close the door and go, uh-uh, you ain't coming in. I know, poor Alex. <laughs> but there's a question here that I want to pose to people this morning. And that is, if you don't know Jesus, today 
He's knocking at your door. And you have a choice. You can either open the door and say, here I am, warts and all, this is me. Or you can close the door. I can tell you now, Jesus is not looking for perfection. If you try to get to perfection, number one, you'll never get there. It's impossible. Because I've just said, you can't get there by works. It's by grace only. But he wants to meet us where we are today. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus doesn't want perfection. He takes us where we are today. That's how wonderful he is. There's nothing we can do, nothing we can do, apart from open the door, metaphorically. Open the door. Say, here you come. This is my life. This is me. And that's what Jesus wants. He's not looking for perfection. He knows it's impossible. What he wants is you. And he wants your heart. And he wants your trust. And that's it. And he'll change your life forever. And so um, I do want to make an appeal. And I'm just going to ask everyone to close their eyes. Just because I get this is daunting. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But if you don't know Jesus this morning. And you're hearing this and thinking. Wow. Do you know what? I know I can't make it. On my own. And I've heard that. And I think. Wow. It is a gift from God. God loves me unconditionally, no matter what I've done. If you don't know Jesus, then would you raise your hand and I would love to introduce you to him this morning. There's no pressure. I'm going to give it 10 seconds and if nobody puts their hand up, then that's absolutely fine. I will move on because I don't want anyone to feel under any pressure whatsoever. But if you are sat there and you're thinking, I'm not quite sure, actually, do you know what, it's a daunting thing. I'm here for the rest of this morning. There are guys that are here from the Alpha course as well. Um, they'd love to talk to you this morning. But I also want to do one other thing as well this morning, is that this morning we were meant to have a baptism. And um, Amy, who was going to get baptised, uh, is poorly this morning, so unfortunately um, she couldn't be here. But as Kate was preparing... Um, was tidying this room the other day and we were expecting um, a good number of visitors and stuff this morning. As she was clearing that space at the back there where the pool is, um, she just felt God say to her, come expectant on Sunday and bring some spare clothes with you just in case there's somebody else who hasn't been baptised but might want to get baptised. And so this morning... I have men's clothes, and I have women's clothes, and I have towels. I know that my brother and sister-in-law, they have the same. I know my good friend at the back, Alison Barnes. We are prepared for God to do something this morning, and we've come with expectant hearts this morning for a baptism. And this is what I know. If you have asked Jesus into your life, baptism is not an additional extra it's a command from Jesus to, be, to believe and to be baptized. And do you know what? Baptism means this. It's a washing away of the past. As you go down into the water, you leave your old self in that pool. You leave all of your sin, all of the muck, everything that is in your life, you leave it. It represents the grave. And as you come back up, you are a brand new creation. You are clean you are made perfect in God's eyes. And do you know what? I will mess up again. But what I do know is this, is that when Jesus looks, when God looks at me, he doesn't see me as someone who's made a mistake. Why? Because he sees Jesus. That's who he sees when he looks at me. He sees Jesus, a perfect, spotless human being. That's not arrogant. It's just who I am. Because the Bible tells me so. These wonderful ladies were singing it this morning. I am who you say I am. I'm a new creation. 
I'm a new creation. And therefore, if you have asked Jesus into your life and you haven't been baptized, there's a pool at the back. We have clothes. We are ready. If you want to get baptized this morning, then please come and see me straight away because we want to get on with it. And my question is this. If you haven't been baptized, why not? Would you not want to be clean? Would you not want to know that all of your past is left down in that water, supplied by Yorkshire water? (laughs) There's nothing special about that water. It's Yorkshire water. It's a hot tub from Amazon. But what it symbolizes is power. It's death and it's brand new life. And it's there for each and every one of us this morning. So if you would like to get baptized this morning, come and tell me now, and we will baptize you. But that's it for this morning's meeting. Let's just pray together. Father, I just want to thank you for a wonderful time in your presence this morning. Father, I want to thank you for your word this morning. Father, I just pray that for whoever in this room that's heard it, Lord, I pray that it would be life to their souls, Father. Father, I pray it would just remind people of who they are, of what they've got, and how they got it. And it's all through you, Jesus. Father, we just want to say thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for us, Father. And Lord, we just want to say, as I said earlier, that we love you, we love you, we love you. Amen. Amen.